SCP-4812, Wrath. The SCP universe is primarily one focused around humans and the effects that these anomalies have on human life. There are articles I've touched upon, though, that are about anomalies interacting with other anomalies, and histories of species other than humans. History often bleeds into the present, though, and with SCP-4812, we'll be looking at some remnants from a couple past kingdoms and setting up for something larger. SCP-4812 describes not one, but three separate entities that are collectively designated as 4812. Conveniently, one of them is classified as Safe, one is Euclid, and one is Keter so we can refer to them as S, E, and K for simplicity. There's also mention of a fourth, redacted entity, but we'll get to that one towards the end. 4812-S is a large, amorphous entity located in a pitch-black cavern underneath France. It's attached to the cave walls by a number of long, adhesive appendages, and its body is covered in many more of these appendages. The entire entity is covered in fine, water-repellent hair. S's anomalous effect is that any living being that views it, either directly or through images or videos, will experience a violent, fatal reaction that is similar to covering your eyes, brain, and nervous system in extremely caustic acid. This effect is immediate and untreatable once initiated, leading victims to suffer severe pain, bleeding through skin and orifices, paralysis, asphyxiation, and eventually death. For this reason, no amount of light is to be let into the cave, and only a completely blind MTF is allowed to interact with the entity. Even the hairs shaved off of the creature cause severe nausea, hallucinations, and swelling of the eyes and brain if viewed, leading to death as well if not treated promptly. Because of these effects, the Foundation isn't really sure what the creature truly looks like, but they do believe that its appendages extend deep into the earth around the cave. Since the cave is sealed with multiple maximum security vault doors and 4812-S doesn't really do much, it's pretty safe. So far, so bloodborne, but we're ramping up now for 4812-E. E is a humanoid entity around 15 meters, or 50 feet in length, constructed primarily of platinum and other metals. Its anomalous effect is that it's a near-perfect heat sink, and the temperature around its body normally is extremely cold. Basically, its body automatically sucks the heat from around it, and it's capable of reducing a standard containment cell to near absolute zero in around 16 seconds. Because of this effect, E is constantly surrounded by an aura of frozen air and water, unless exposed to high temperatures, obscuring its true appearance. Obviously, this effect is pretty lethal to humans, killing in seconds as the water inside of their bodies freezes. E is contained then by being kept inside of a tank of molten iron, in a containment chamber that's kept at a constant 1400 degrees Celsius. A drop in internal temperature of more than 50 degrees is considered a breach of containment. Okay, a little trickier, but still contained. The Foundation is having a lot of trouble, though, with 4812-K. K is a massive winged insectoid resembling a cross between a stag beetle and a scorpion. It's roughly 180 meters, or nearly 600 feet in length with six appendages, two of which end in large pincers, and a long tail ending in a serrated barb. Curiously though, instead of an insectoid mouth and eyes, it instead has a human face, the size of a normal human male, meaning that it looks especially small compared to its massive body. It also has four wings, and its entire body is covered in a thick, highly reflective chitin making it nearly invisible visually. K spends most of its time in the upper stratosphere of Earth, rarely moving in any perceptible way except to maintain altitude. Because of its invisibility, the fact that it doesn't produce heat or reflect sound, 
and its rate of movement meant that the Foundation had no idea it even existed for a long time. Now that they know it exists though, they of course have to try and contain it, but it's been rough going. Any ship or drone that could keep pace with it, as it can travel in excess of 800 kilometers per hour, are easily destroyed by its strength and size. Any weapon that has actually connected with it has not damaged it in any perceptible way. In fact, it would seem that any kinetic energy that collides with it is reflected entirely, leading Foundation researchers to think that the entity is in some way a near-perfect reflector. So far then, we have three rather unique entities, none of which really pose an excessive threat, but also don't seem to be connected in any meaningful way. We're told that none of the entities should ever be exposed to either of the other two, but we'll have to read on to find out more. The next item related to 4812 is a series of documents and artifacts recovered from an anomalous collector before his death. The collection is named the Connington Set, after the 18th century English archaeologist and occultist Winston J. Connington, whose research led the Foundation to discover multiple SCPs. The collection includes 16 coins of various shapes and sizes, none of which match any known currency, five Egyptian papyrus scrolls that appear to be ancient star maps, with illegible notes in the margins that seem to have been bleached out at some point, three large leather-bound tomes written in German, full of what appeared to be archaic coordinates, with one book marking changes in temperature. These books were seemingly written over the course of many years. A brass spyglass with a cracked crystal lens, containing a number of small ornate mechanisms. A thick burlap sack containing at least three more consecutive burlap sacks, and in the center, a thick gelatinous mass. Looking at the sack tends to make subjects feel ill and suffer from a slight burning sensation behind their eyes. A pair of glasses with iron frames and solid iron lenses, which when worn, show a slight glow when looking at the burlap sack. A thin circlet made of gold and platinum, with three prongs situated around the circlet, two of which are broken, and one contains a small glass sphere that is warm to the touch. Finally, there's a journal, written by Connington himself, which contains depictions of all three 4812 entities and his personal research. One of the three leather-bound books has a short section in Italian, presumably written by a different author than the rest, containing a list of names and dates. Many of the dates have another number written after the date, such as 1343-89, listed next to the name Tornold of Yair. The rest of the section has been translated for us, and it's here we get our first bit of history. There apparently was a great, old, lost kingdom that was respected above all others, known as the House of Apollyon, or the Sky Kings of Old Europe. The first of their kings, Harion von Apollyon I, was said to have descended from the blood of the King of Crimson Skies, often called Assem, the First Man. The Sky Kings apparently ruled Old Europe for a hundred generations, facing opposition from the Deva to the east, and those faithful to the Iron God to the south, presumably meaning the Mechanites, the precursors to the Church of the Broken God. The House of Apollyon were conquerors, and it was some conquered foes that first called King Itis von Apollyon Sky King, because it was said that his reach extended past the bounds of the earth. Complacency reared its ugly head though, and eventually King Saurus von Apollyon VIII grew bored with ruling old Europe and set out to conquer an even greater realm. He looked past the lands of men, across the sea where the fair folk were said to live, and set sail with the largest army ever assembled on the path of unnecessary war. I've talked about fairies in the SCP universe before in SCP-4000 and the Factory-001 proposal, but knowledge of these articles is irrelevant for this one. The Fair Folk were caught up in a war with the emerging power of the Children of the Moon, presumably meaning SCP-1000, and were blindsided by Saurus's attack. 
Their people were utterly brutalized and scattered, with the nobility stripped down and mutilated. Only one survivor was taken as a trophy, a fey princess. The princess had other plans, though, and on the return trip, she cast a wicked spell upon the house of Apollyon and the Sky King in particular, bringing a terrible storm down onto the ships. During this, she prayed to an old and nameless god for vengeance upon the house of Apollyon, and legend says that her iron chains caught fire and burned Saurus's ship to cinder. They also say that Saurus himself was dragged down into the ocean depths by those same iron chains. The destruction wasn't total, and the remaining ships managed to still take the princess back to the kingdom where young Saurus von Apollyon IX now ruled. Knowing what she had done, Saurus threw the princess into a dungeon deep beneath the earth and sealed it, leaving her to rot in the dark. To assist in preventing any further retribution from the fair folk and their dark magic, Saurus appointed four great knights to defend the kingdom. Lahir the Fierce, Lancelot the Cunning, Hector the Stalwart, and Ogier the Faithful. So far, this is just starting to sound like the plot for Dark Souls 4, and while we can safely guess that the amorphous entity in the cave under France is the Fairy Princess, the explanation for the other two is a little murkier. Unfortunately, the majority of Connington's journal is written in a cipher, but a few short sections have been translated. One section quotes an archivist that worked for the House of Apollyon, and discusses the first of the great profanities. Apparently, the voice of the enemy beneath the earth spoke to the souls of the four great knights, and Sky King Apollyon was forced to banish them. The long night settled over his kingdom, and the winter winds came from the east, but Hector did not answer. From the far darkness came something called the Venuvenex, or the Profane Restrictor, the first of the great profanities. The Venuvenex cast a cold hand across the king's only daughter, killing her. The king retaliated by taking the godless lance and the mammoth's hide and drove the spear into the Venuvenex, driving it into the flaming heart of the earth. Interesting. And it's worth noting that the four knights are not the 4812 entities. They became something else that isn't really relevant here. The point is that they couldn't protect the kingdom from these profanities, the first of which seems to be E, the metallic entity that sucks the heat from the air around it. The king lost his daughter to this monster, but he managed to drive it deep into the earth where the great temperature will subdue it, using the godless lance. As for the identity of this lance, if you're familiar with the Ouroboros cycle, you've heard of it before referred to as the Spear of the Non-Believer. Another section discusses another of these profanities, the Profane Adamant, also called the Lamenelant, or the King of Many Faces by the Deva. This would be 4812-K, and it apparently caused a lot of issues for the Deva, as it appeared as if from a space beyond space to destroy their kingdom. Anything that the Deva and their warriors tried to do against the creature was turned back on themselves, and when they had been ground into dust, the creature took their faces and returned to the skies. The final of the profanities was known as the Profane Dark, as it festered in the enemy's grave until it soaked through the earth and burst out. It proceeded to pull the Sky King into the void, and the Sky King cursed it by calling it Yash, the last foe of man. And when the Sky King watched as his kingdom was ruined without the assistance of the four knights, all he could repeat was one word, wrath. The author says that he has seen the face of the Lamenelant, and he knows of the fiery chasm in which the Venuvenex seethes, but he dares not seek out the profane dark. Quoting another author, they write that the eyes of Yash offer no release into death, only the winding roads of torment that lead to the puller of eyes and sharpener of spines, where no man returns and no voices are heard. The castle of fire, 
the king of crimson skies, the reaper of dreams, flees from the eyes of Yash, the last scream of the nameless folk beyond the sea. Men scream out and are silenced. The light of the sun invites order to the most fundamental nature of this world, and the Yash abhors it. Wrath. 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 This would seem to be the redacted entity mentioned only briefly at the start, the greatest of the three profanities, and what sounds like quite a cosmic horror. Enough history though, let's bring things back to the present with the Foundation's containment efforts of S, E, and K. K first came to the attention of the Foundation in 1964 when it passed over the northern USSR and was mistaken for an experimental US aircraft causing Soviet fighters to engage it. K rapidly ascended and disappeared from sight before re-engaging the fighters at high speeds and quickly destroying them. Since then, K has only been detected a handful of times, mostly due to visual distortions caused by its reflective skin. It seems to follow a vague pattern over the Earth, often passing over the containment sites of S and E, as well as something else which is redacted. E was found shortly after the Foundation received the Connington set, following up on some coordinates in one of the tomes. This led them to a thermal anomaly beneath a lake, and their investigations ended up opening a fissure beneath the lake, causing temperatures to rapidly drop, as E was released from the thermal vent it was trapped in. An MTF was brought in to contain the entity, but its temperature draining effect made this difficult. Worse still, E was beginning to move towards the nearest population center, resulting in the MTF utilizing long-range artillery weapons to bombard it. The combination of a controlled gas explosion next to E and a massive molten slag being dropped on top of it by remote drone led to the entity finally being contained. As for S, the Foundation Administrator had mentioned the site of the cave in his notes as a location of interest since other occult investigative organizations had known about the cave for some time. Up until Foundation involvement though, they believed that the cave itself was an anomaly, since no one who had gone in had ever come back out. On June 9, 2002, three months after the containment of E, K was seen diverting from its normal flight pattern, heading towards an area in the North Sea. For some reason, K had suddenly engaged with a Global Occult Coalition transport ship, an action that had so far never been recorded, as K only normally attacked when provoked. The Foundation swooped in to assist, and managed to drive away K from the transport ship. They then offered transport assistance to the ship, but the GOC refused and continued on, eventually docking in Norway. At the same time that this skirmish was going on, E had become increasingly active, necessitating the activation of previously untested technology to further increase the containment temperature. Also, several tremors were felt near the site of S, and seismographs revealed that a large portion of the cave system had collapsed, and S has since moved upwards no less than 70 meters. So yeah, it would seem that the GOC were up to some shenanigans, and they've got the three entities upset. Sometime after those events, the Foundation received a transmission from the GOC, informing the Foundation that they are forbidden from further involvement with three specific paranormal entities. The first is given the codename Mars by the GOC, a massive winged scorpioid entity, K. The second is called Pluto, a large human-like entity that dramatically alters the total energy of the system directly surrounding it, E. The third though is called Eros, a small, partially mummified, vaguely human-like entity currently in possession of the GOC. We haven't really heard about this one yet, and the Foundation doesn't believe that Eros is one of the three entities described in the Connington set meaning not one of the three profane entities. The GOC know that the Foundation have E, and tell them to make every effort to destroy it, as well as turn over all info they have about it and the other two entities to the GOC. See, the GOC don't have the information from the Connington set, 
but the Foundation doesn't have some info that the GOC have found, meaning no one's playing with a full hand of cards. The GOC tells them that the Russians managed to get a tracking device on K a few years ago, allowing them to accurately follow its path. It seems to be looking for something. They believe that E, K, and the Eros entity they have are the three profanities, and they're looking for the princess that cursed them into existence. Following K's path, it appears to be favoring someplace in France, the cave where S is located. They thought that Eros was the princess at first, but it's too small to be a human woman, and the physiology is all wrong. Like I said, the GOC don't have all the info, and they have no idea that fairies were involved. This means that S is not the princess. Eros is. They've been trying to kill Eros to weaken the princess, which they believe to be in the cave, not realizing that Eros is the princess. K attacked their transport ship containing Eros to free her, because only the princess can fully control the three of them, including the profane Dark, which is the entity in the cave. The Foundation realizes at this point that things are very close to complete disaster, and rush to completely seal in the cave while trying to figure out a way to shoot K out of the sky. All in all, this is just a lot of fun world building, with glimpses of past anomalous civilizations, and the way that ancient history in the SCP universe often sticks around to complicate the present. I mostly covered this SCP to provide some background info for another SCP, 4840, but it's a great article on its own too. Funny that this all came about because a single king wasn't satisfied with his kingdom, and unfortunately attacked some very wrathful foes.